welcome to our uh, out of school time community meetings that we are hosting almost every Friday. And happy, happy new year. If I haven't seen you before, I hope you had a good beginning of the year and we are very, you know, hopeful with the new administration in Washington DC. So it looks like this year is going to be with a lot of promises. Saying that, I would like to welcome everybody and to our meetings, as I said before, and I'm going to pass the mic to Jen. Um, I think I'm actually taking the mic, but yes, welcome everybody. Sorry, sorry. Like um, this. Um, so first we're just gonna go through a couple quick announcements and then Jen's gonna um, talk a little bit about community schools and like why we are bringing them to this OSP after school, um, out of school time um, community meeting. And then we'll hear from Bryce Principal Foster and then Community School Ross. And I'm now debating heavily how to pronounce his last name, so I apologize. Um, and our goal is to leave about 10, 15 minutes at the end to have some questions um, and just open up the conversation there. So first of all, later this, or next week, sorry, on Wednesday, January 27th at 9 a.m., we will be taking part in the America After 3 p.m. Twitter chat. And America After 3 p.m. is a new set of data that has been released by the After School Alliance. Um, and I believe it occurs every four to five years. And it's really to get a landscape of what the after school time and out of school time field looks like. Um, and so the purpose of the Twitter chat is to educate people like, hey, we have this huge set of data out there. Um, there's the national level data as well as Hawaii specific data. Um, and we want to just educate people that this data set is out there and please use it as broadly and as widely as you can because we don't want the data set to go to waste. Um, and so I'll put the link to the chat to the um, where the data is hosted, the America After 3 p.m. the report there. Um, but if you would like to join the Twitter chat, you can follow along After School for All, which is um, After School Alliance's Twitter handle. We'll be posting the questions and then people will be responding to them. So feel free to just read along, tweet along, um, anything that would help with, anything you would find helpful with that. The next announcement is um, organizational level vaccine signup. And so frontline essential workers are now receiving vaccines coordinated either through their employer or the industry organization, as well as adults 75 and older are now receiving it. Um, and we have confirmed that after school staff are eligible to receive the vaccine in stage 1B under the category of K through 12 educational staff. Um, and so I'll drop the link into the chat that is for edu or for organizations to sign up so that their staff can receive the vaccine. And then the last announcement that we have is next Friday, January 29th, our um, OST meeting will be around supporting Micronesian communities. And so we'll hear from President and CEO Paul Haddock from Prel about Micronesian culture and context about how we can more culturally be more culturally responsive to meet the needs of these students and families. And lastly, I'll pass it to Paula for a quick update from the Board of Education meetings from yesterday. Thank you, Lexi. Yes, just a quick a share out about the Board of Education meeting yesterday. The big news is that uh, the governor announced that instead of a 10% budget cut for the department, it's going to be only 2.5%. So everybody embraced that great news. And the other point they were discussing about um, private tutors to support students and summer programs. Uh, but that's, that's as much as I would like to share, but I'm sure you can read more in the Board of Education website. Okay, I think that is it for announcements. So we'll hop in um, to our conversation. And we wanted to start off with this image um, to get us thinking about community schools. So just take a moment to take a look observe and see what's going on here. And then you can either out loud, you can unmute yourself and share verbally, or you can put it in the chat box. Share what you notice in this cartoon. What do you see going on over here? Oh, 
Well, I would say that, um, hi, this is Tony from Susanna Wesley Community Center. And we, we can just talk, right? You said, gave permission? Okay. Um, is that you have, you see the student that is running behind, but they're carrying all these reasons that they may be behind, whether they're hunger, they're sick, or um, homelessness. So those are kind of like the weight that they're carrying um, and reasons that potentially they're they're late or behind. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we have um, similar uh, comments in the chat around um, basic needs not being met and how can we learn with that, the inequities, barriers to attending school. I see, um, Pa'ano, he put, there are onlookers as well. We have the adult who's just standing in the background and he's kind of passive and not doing anything. Um, yeah, the unavoidable baggage that kids have um, a lot on the plate and they have no avenue to dump it, yeah. Um, schools come with a lot of bag baggage. Yeah, I used to have a, a professor in college who would say that kids are not just the head rolling into the classroom, they're bringing their whole selves and that includes other things that's happening in their lives. Missing the tool is super cool. Mm -hmm. And how are we helping our, our students with the challenges outside academic ones? Yes, awesome. Yeah, thank you all for sharing. Um, so with those things in mind, um, what do our schools need um, to do? What needs to happen in our schools for students to learn and thrive and to not quote unquote be late to math class? You know, what conditions need to be put in place? So again, you can feel free to unmute yourself and share or put in the chat box your thoughts. So I see everyone needs to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. We need basic needs to be taken care of, comprehensive support, and it needs to be more than just one place of person. We need trauma-informed approaches, definitely. Strength and sense of ha, yes. Um, food security, consistent, and I would also add caring adults, sense of overall safety and support. Yes, these are all really awesome things. Social services includes food programs, other resources. Yeah, we need to be taking care of kids' basic needs and necessities so that they can then think about learning. The school needs to be a safe place for them to be. Mm -hmm. We need to have a strong, positive school climate where kids feel welcome to come, that families feel welcome to come as well. Yes, yeah, so we need to see the kids as a priority, exactly, yes. They need to be the center of um, our decision-making and how we design our schools <laughs> needs to be kid-centered. Awesome, thank you all for, for sharing those thoughts. So all of that, of what you guys shared falls under what a community school does. So the basic idea of what a community school is, is that it's a strategy where the school becomes the hub of its neighborhood. And to explain it a bit more, I'm gonna use this infographic from the Learning Policy Institute that shows the four pillars of a community school. So the first one we have is expanded learning time. So in a community school, after school and summer learning programs are integrated into the school's design and they provide students enrichment activities, opportunities to go out into the community, to have real world experiences, to explore their passions and strengths, all of those really awesome things that we know are important for a well-rounded education. We have family and community engagement as another pillar. So this is the intentional, meaningful engagement of families. That includes you know, providing families supports, helping them access services, going back to the notion of the school is the hub of the community, so families are welcome as well. And it's also about building families' capacities and skills so that they can be active participants in their child's education. Integrated student supports is the other pillar. So bringing in the supports and the services to address the whole child, making sure that our children's physical, mental, emotional health are taken care of. And then the last pillar, which I think is the one that makes community schools the most unique from other traditional schools, is collaborative leadership. 
So in a community school, the community has a shared sense of ownership of the school. So if you notice in the image, there is a round table over there. There's no one at the head of the table making all the decisions. Instead, you have families, youth, community partners, teachers, school leaders. They're all working together to figure out what are the barriers to learning and how can we come up with solutions to make our school more equitable. And part of this collaborative leadership team is a community school coordinator. Sometimes they're also called a community school manager or a community school director. And ideally, each school will have a full-time person who job is to just coordinate the strategic community partnerships and make sure that the partners are aligned with the needs of the students and also that they're coordinated with each other. So we have this cohesive system of supports instead of siloed or piecemeal initiatives. So we're seeing a lot of um, momentum around community schools nationally. Last fall, um, there were a couple of bills introduced in Congress to dramatically increase the funding for the full service community schools program. We're expecting to see a lot more movement and federal support and funding for community schools under the Biden administration. Um, and that's part, part of the reason why we're doing, having this conversation now is we wanna bring more awareness of the community school strategy to Hawaii so we are able to take advantage of those opportunities when we have federal funding available. Community schools also present an opportunity to move forward from COVID. We are still figuring out, you know, how much learning loss and trauma and social emotional needs our students will have, but it's not realistic to assume that schools will be able to tackle all of those challenges by themselves. It'll have to be an all hands on deck approach to help students catch up academically and help them recover from the trauma of the pandemic. We'll need to partner with our after school providers so we can make sure our students have access to more learning and enrichment opportunities. We'll need to be working with families as partners and seeing them as part of the solution. We're going to need to adjust the whole child and we'll need to have this coordinated systematic approach where everyone is working together. So community schools is not anything new to Hawaii. There's been many people working on this idea of schools becoming the hub of their communities tying it to place-based, cultural-based education for many years. But today we're gonna to hear the stories from two of our guest speakers of how they're using community schools to support their students and families. So we have Vice Principal James Sester from Waipahu Elementary and Ross Paget from, who's a Partners in Development Foundation, Community School Manager at the Elementary, Middle and High Schools in Kohala. So we will have a Q&A at the end of both of their presentations. So if you have questions while they're presenting, feel free to just pop them in the chat box and we'll be take, keeping track of all the questions that come in and saving them for the Q&A. Um, I'll also mention that we will be sharing these slides later today, so you don't have to worry about that. But without further ado, I will pass it on to Vice Principal Suster. Hi, good morning. Um, so again, James Suster, I'm at Waipa Elementary School. Uh, so this notion of full service community school model really came to my attention in 2018 when I met Paula and After School Alliance and, and I really didn't think of our school as this, it was just we were just trying to do things to help our community and help our students. So um, this idea of being a community school is relatively new to me as well in regards to what we call it. We didn't really have a name for it, we were just kind of that's how we did business. So, um, so a little bit about our school. Um, we're located in, uh, in Waipahu, obviously, um, lower income neighborhoods. Uh, you can switch the um, slide. Uh, we have a, a, normally we have a little over a thousand students. This year, our, our enrollment has gone down a lot. We're at about 930 just because people are just not registering their students for, for school in our area. And we've been trying to work hard with that. Um, we have 85% free reduced lunch, 48% of our students are EL. So when we do like right now, wide access tests, we're testing, you know, 450 students. Um, we have 8% SPED, 13% documented MVA. And I say documented MVA because we have many families we feel like would qualify for MVA under doubling up, but they don't fill out the forms um, to become MVA. They say that they do have a house. So we've had to explain some of that to our families as well. And, and, and what that means for them because they have a, a real place for their own and a lot of cultural diversity, yeah. Um, 
So we started this, uh, this community school uh, journey um, with attendance. Uh, attendance at Wipal Elementary School wasn't like super bad, but it wasn't great. I mean, we were getting about uh, 93 to 94% of our students attending you know, school every day. Uh, we would end up with about a 16 to 17% chronic absentee rate. So in the 2017-18 school year, that's when we really started um, really focusing on attendance, really trying to reach out to the community to see why students weren't coming to school. Okay, next. All right, so the, the, it really just started with a phone call, yeah? Uh, started with phone calls, started calling families on why students weren't coming to school. Um, in these phone calls, I mean, relationship building is, is key. And when it talks about, you know, building a, a culture at your school, um, building those relationships with the parents, students, community, that's the biggest thing. And, and staying positive on these, and on, on these calls were, was the most important thing. Uh, no matter if the kid had two absences or 50 absences, we didn't place blame. We just tried to find out and, and took a caring approach on how we can assist students in coming to school. What can we do to help? And that's when we started learning about our families. Um, you know, if phone numbers weren't working, which we were getting a lot of, we'd make home visits and we'd go out every day and we still go out every day. Um, our principal calls it boots and ground, finding out what's going on with our students, why they're not coming to school, um, what we can do to help help with that, yeah? And then we, get, we began to see all the reality of how they live, where they live, and how hard it would be if I was in that situation. Yeah. All right, so we started with an attendance challenge. So we wanted to make incentives for students to come to school, but also so parents could see like, oh, the school really is trying to get my kid to come to school. Um, students were responsible for tracking their attendance. And then um, the goal wasn't to have perfect attendance. The goal was to have improved attendance. So every cycle, if they improve their attendance from the last cycle, then they would be put into a drawing to to win one of the incentives that you see there on the right, which is like extra um, recess and extra for those that don't like to be outdoors, uh, indoor activities. And then we also have a snack bar where they could get a $1.50 coupon so they can get a snack after school. So this is how we started with the attendance. And it, and it did, it definitely helped. We've been in the green in attendance over the last uh, three years. So we've had 90, we, we went from 93 to 94% of our students coming to school every day to now um, the mid 95.5% of our students coming to school every day with our chronic absentee rate ranging between eight to 10% the last three years. Um, so it, it has been working, but then from there, it kind of snowballed into a lot of other things. Um, so going on home visits, we got to learn where our students live, right? So these are pictures from Aniani and what we call the poopoos here um, in Waipahu, where there's just literally thousands of students that live in this small community of maybe, you know, in the poopoos, there's maybe about 20 to 25 buildings. And then on Aniani, there's about, I would say another 15 buildings. And we literally have thousands of students um, elementary, high school, and intermediate age that live in these two areas. So it's a lot of people living in a very small area. Um, so a lot of people live in, in, in one apartment. Yeah. So by going out, um, you know, we got to see some of the, the mass. We, we call it the mass that some of our students live in, right? Um, you know, we thought we knew our students. We thought we knew what they needed, what they, what they didn't have. So, you know, we got to, to learn about a lot more health issues transportation issues, basic needs of not having food, clothes, shelter, you know, abuse issues, not being able to afford uniforms, um, not coming to school because they're caring for other siblings. So all of these things we're able to start learning about our students. And then from there, we have all this information. Now, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to support them? We can't just say we're going to go out and find out the issues and know the issues, but now what are we going to do? So when we think about equity, we always want, we want everything to be equitable. We want it to be equitable. Well, um, it's not equitable for our kids in White Pop. Um, right now, the reality, which you can see in that picture, that's what it looks like. Our kids are starting off in the hole, right? So how do we build them up in the hole so that they can see the baseball game as well? Um, like they're not even starting at ground level, they're starting below. So our goal was to try and get them as, as high above that fence as we could. Um, so we started 
simple um, in, in a way. We wanted just to get people to be comfortable with our campus. Our campus is 121 years old, so it's very old. It's not, it, it's not very modern, right? So very old style building. So our first goal was to, you know, make it a more welcoming place for our families. So we started building, um, painting murals around campus. So this was the first one we did. And this mural is really a place where a lot of our families come. They'll come to our campus just to take pictures in front of this mural because it says White Pao and they have so much pride in their community. So, so having this and getting parents and students to come on campus and feel that sense of pride. Um, anytime it's graduation season, people are always here taking pictures in front of this mural. Um, the second mural that you'll see is uh, our basketball court. It was a place before where a lot of people would come in graffiti that wall. Um, we had volunteers come in and then an artist come in to write White Powell Elementary School on that wall just to be, you know, the, sh the main street of our school is, you know, you, you pass by this mural, everybody sees it. Um, nobody's graffitied it since we put this mural on two years ago. So, <clears throat> um, you know, just building that sense of pride in our community and in our school. And then, uh, the last mural, we are at Choose Love School now. So about a year and a half ago, one of our teachers' um, fiancés had, had made this mural for us for Choose Love. Uh, most of our students pass by this wall coming and going from school. So just trying to get our school to be a nicer um, place and a place where people want to be and, and parents aren't afraid to come in. It's more welcoming and open. So we started with that, started getting parents in, starting having um, them more comfortable with being on campus. <laughs> Now to get people on campus, the easiest way to do that is to have fun activities, right? So we had to um, start having more fun activities for our parents to come in just so that we can give them a taste of what we're trying to do, um, our personality, how we're trying to get our school to be better. So we started this dinner in a movie with Santa uh, three years ago. We continued it every year, even this year, which I'll get into later. Um, it got so good and so popular last year, the Hawaii Five-O and Magnum PI people donated presents to all of our students. And then they made an appearance at our um, at our event and it was awesome because they took pictures with everyone. Um, nobody knew that they were coming until the day of. We knew but we didn't announce it so it was it was an awesome experience for for the school as well as the students and families that did show up to this. And then of course word spread that you know all of the things that we're doing. We have a school mascot now. You might think that the little um, you know who cares but it's important because whenever we have school events the mascot comes out, people take pictures of them. You know, there's a line of, of, of parents and students who want their kids to take pictures of the students. So it's, it's building that pride in the school. And, and again, getting families to be on campus and slowly getting them more involved in what we're doing as, as a school. And then we created our Eagle Store, um, an incentive program for students who are, you know, showing the Choose Love pillars, um, becoming um, better people. Uh, and, and following the, the core values of our complex, which is respect, responsibility, honesty. So they earn these eagle bucks for showing, you know, the choose love pillars as well as the um, core values of our complex. And with these eagle bucks, they're able to, uh, you know, buy things from our eagle store, which we've been able to fund through like Hawaii Five-O and Magnum PI, donate a bunch of toys and things from in our store, as well as us, you know, fundraising and, and, and getting donations from Walmart and, and other things um, to fill our store with prizes for our kids, motivate them to come to school, to be a school, that a school is a place where people care about me, where I can, you know, get some of the things that I wouldn't necessarily get um, at home because of the situation that they're living in. So you can click to the store, just show that real quick and then click over to the next one. So this is our Eagle store. It's like a half classroom that we converted. Now, some of the next slides kind of talk about the really important stuff that we're doing. So Auntie Carolyn's closet. So Carolyn Denny, who's shown this picture here, she helped to start this closet where she was able to get a lot of donations from the community for shoes, clothes, um, toiletries. So this picture is a little bit old. This is before we used to just have one closet. So we had one storeroom that had boys and girls clothes. Now we have two. One is for boys, one is for girls. So we have tons of shoes, we have tons of clothes, we have toiletries that we, we give out um, to, to families who need it. So these closets have been super beneficial for kids who the reason why they don't come to school is because they don't have slippers, they don't have clothes, they don't have clean, you know, pants. So um, this closet has been very helpful. And then when they have banquet and stuff, we have nice clothes in here that we bought so they can borrow like a nice dress to go to the banquet or a nice shirt to go to graduation and things like that. 
Alright, our West Academic Center. This was in conjunction with the um, Homeless Concerns Office. So we were to get money uh, from Homeless Concerns Office to start this academic center. Pretty much, it's like a it's like a after school A plus type program that our counselors run, but it's open to a lot of our MBA students. So students who don't have place to go after school, where they do fun activities, but then they also work on the homework. So a lot of the stuff that um, students can't get their homework completed at home. Those students get invited to the academic center to get help with their homework, as well as do these fun activities, which again is funded through MBA as well as 21st century. So we're pulling from different monies to, to help fund um, some of our centers and, and programs. Um, also through with, with the Homeless Concerns Office, we're able to get a lot of uniforms. So we have a tardy table and a uniform loaner table. And then we also do uku cleaning because a big problem in our community is kids having ukus. Um, and keeping them in class, sometimes I know we're supposed to, and we try to, and we do now, but it was very difficult in Waipawa where this is a chronic concern for a lot of families. So instead of calling parents saying, you got to clean them out, you know, we clean them out. Uh, we don't use any chemicals, just shampoo. We just, you know, comb it out and then send them back to class so that at least the majority of what was in their hair is out and then they can go back to class. So instead of missing a whole day, they might be missing 20 minutes to half an hour. The tardy table, sometimes uniforms are an issue. So we have a loaner table. Obviously during COVID right now, we haven't been able to do the loaners, but um, students, they come to the table, they don't have a uniform, they give us their shirt, we give them the loaner. At the end of the day, they come and exchange it back and forth. Um, you know, a lot of schools have washers and dryers now. Again, Homeless Concerns Office helped us with that. So we have our wash, two sets of washer and dryers where you know, if the homeless liaison needs a family to come in to wash clothes, she's able to call me, make an appointment. They come in, they can wash their clothes. Um, we wash a lot of our students' clothes. Again, um, for our loaner, to, uh, our uniform loaner system, we wash the, the uniforms that come back daily. Uh, that way, the next day, they're, they're clean to go back out again. Um, because of all of the you know, home visits and some of the things we're doing, we were able to get a, a state car for, um, you know, to help us with, with our efforts. So we have a state car that myself and the counselors use now to go out into community because we are literally out there daily. Um, since COVID ha has happened, we're out there more than ever because students are now distance learning and not on campus. So we have to go to them to make sure that they're doing what they need to do. Um, some of the other things that we've done, you know, with, with not just our MBA students, but just students in need, um, you know, we've, we've cut their hair before, obviously we get with parents permission, but some of them will come and, and it's just irritating for them. I mean, I know for me, just having my hair longer, just a little bit longer than what it is now, it, it gets very irritating. Um, and, and they don't have the funds to be able to cut their hair on a regular basis. So we've cut their hair. A student on the right didn't have his glasses for a month. We took him to Kaiser to get his glasses. Uh, so using that state car to help, um, you know, students in our community, not just in school, but to get to places they need to get, especially for doctor's appointments um, and things that they need to succeed in school. Okay, uh, we can skip through. We made partnerships with Hawaiian Island Flag Football. I know I have 30 seconds left. Um, the next slide shows some other partnerships with uh, Project um, Kealoho and Victory Outreach. Um, they've come to our school to work with some of our kids. If we can go to the last slide with the, kind of the COVID stuff, would be good. Um, Hawaii Food Bank, uh, we do a pantry. But I really want to get to um, this slide here. So post-pandemic. So right now with the pandemic, uh, home visits have been more than ever with distance learning. Uh, we're out in the community. We go on at least 10 to 15 home visits daily. Um, so our counselors are out there right now. Uh, we were able to hold and continue some of our activities which engage families. We had a virtual bingo night, a virtual Christmas night where we gave out prizes and, and, um, and, and kids got to do a Kahoot to answer questions about our school to earn prizes and gift cards and we got donations from the community for that. Our school pantry is going to start back up February 5th. Uh, we're, we're getting the food bank back out here because um, we're finding that to be a big need in our community. Um, as students come back for third quarter, uh, we're already starting a Marlama Mentors. It'll be virtual. We, we work with the high school 
uh, Waipawa High School students, the Malama mentors there, where online we're going to set up some of our students who are coming face to face virtual with their students. And hopefully in fourth quarter, we can start our West Academic Center again face to face. And then um, we've had many clothing and shoe donations during the pandemic. We also, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, we delivered a lot of toiletry bags to families who were in need of, you know, when toilet paper was hard to come by. We had a lot from, uh, from, from our donations previously and other toiletries. So these are just some of the things we're doing. Not everything is, is you know, going awesome, but it's, it's some of the things that we're trying to do to, to help our community, to help our families and, and get them, you know, where we can reach that equitable level. So um, I think that's my time, but thank you for listening. And again, later we'll have some questions. Great, thank you so much, Vice Principal Sester. Um, so now I'd like to invite Ross um, from the Kohala schools to talk about um, the work that they're doing. Hello everyone, my name is Ross Paget. I am from Kohala on the Big Island and um, I am partnering up with the Kohala Elementary, Middle and High School and our, our I guess you could say project is called Pihau Me Kapono, which means a community that has all of its needs fulfilled. Um, I work for Partners in Development Foundation. Um, some of you probably know it, know the biggest program as Tutu and Me Traveling Preschool. So uh, I am part of another program that is helping the three schools out in Kuala. You can go to the next slide, please. So um, you know, the mission for Partners in Development Foundation, you know, inspires and equips families and communities for success and service using timeless Native Hawaiian values and traditions. You know, the idea, the goal is, you know, having healthy and resilient communities. And I've been working for Partners in Development Foundation for eight years, and I've been a recipient of what they've done uh, personally for my family and I. Uh, without getting into too much details, um, my family and I lost two of our, our, our boys. And so during that time, we were struggling through some things where Partners in Development Foundation and, and also the, the three schools that I worked with, they really were responded and helped me through um, our struggles and, and our situation. So in return, you know, knowing what Partners in Development Foundation is all about and, and being able to build that partnership with the, the three schools. I grew up in Kohala, so I went to the elementary, I went to the middle school, I went to the high school. At one point, all K through 12 was all on one campus and I was a part of that before. So in a way, um, Kohala grew up as one big school together until it got a little bit too big to, it, to where they had to move the middle school down the street three miles. So we can move on to the uh, next slide. And with, with that idea of what a role of a coordinator or, or manager is, you know, it's an individual who works closely and, and does things with the, the school principals. Normally, I'll be honest, normally it's just one coordinator with one principal um, due to funding. I had the opportunity to work with three principals. So it was, you know, at one point working with three principals, three different schools, you, you need to learn how to collaborate. But one of the biggest things that we appreciated from Partners in Development Foundation was the partnership we established with the, the high school principal, uh, Jeanette Snelling, before she moved on to her um, new position. She saw this idea of community school and she wanted this for, for Kohala and the idea of being able to implement those things and, and knowing that academics was, wasn't just the the thing that we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about the whole child and, and other things like Jen showed in that one picture of all, that child carrying all the, the baggage and the things that they come with to school. And Vice Principal Suster, you know, he explained a lot of the things that he's been doing at his school to where it's similar to what I'm doing with the three schools out here, uh, building partnerships, um, building relationships. And it's, it's such an important thing. Uh, next slide, please. So for Kohala, one of the things that has been a, a, a positive side is our elementary principal, Hannah Loyola, middle school principal, Alan Brown, and um, our high school principal, Amy Stafford, they got together and they, we all talked about the idea of what do we want to do together so that we can show our, our families that we're really listening to them. So one of the ideas that they came up with was coffee talk hours. So before COVID happened, they had these coffee talk hours to invite parents and community members to come and, and listen on updates for the school, but also 
for the parents and the community members to share their concerns. Um, when we did our first coffee talk, there was the, a lot of construction going on. So a lot of the parents were concerned about the safety of the, the children on campus. And the three principals and I were able to listen and take, take into account the concerns. Um, we did some of the things were listening to what the, the students and the children were concerned about. One example was at the high school level. The, the girls said, there's the, the locks on the bathroom doors are broken. So I have to shut the, I have to hold the door shut in order to use the bathroom. So being able to take into account and listen to their concerns, we we're able to take care of some of those things. The very next day, you know, the principal talked to the custodian and said, please go get the locks. Let's go get that all fixed. It was fixed the very next day. And then the students took notice of, wow, they're actually listening to us. So it's not just about the academic piece, but we're actually listening to what they they needed help with or what was their concern. So with the coffee talks, how we're doing it now, unfortunately, we'd love to have it in person, but we're doing it through uh, WebEx and the parents and, and community members can still participate. I'm the facilitator uh, in those coffee talks. So if there's any questions, I'll present those questions to the, the three principals and one of them will answer. It's really given an opportunity for um, myself and the three principals to be able to to listen and and like really listen. Uh, I know I have my phone, but sometimes I'm walking around campus, right? And usually when you're talking to somebody, your your hand is is talking to someone, but your focus is on the phone. Now I'm trying to tell people I'm listening to you and I'm taking notes on my phone so that I don't forget what you're telling me, so that they know that I'm actually listening to them and and wanting to help them with their concern. Now we can move on to the next slide. So, you know, typical components of what, um, you know, community school, you know, you have after school and summer enrichment programs, you have your parent and family engagement, your adult education, you, you're actually taking a look at your, you know, medical, dental, mental health and social services, even early childhood. And with, with that being said, you know, when the pandemic happened, it really affected, I know it affected everyone, but Kohala being on the north side of the island and kind of separated from from everything, we needed to take a look at how we were able to to help certain families. I came across a family who, unfortunately, two of the parents were very sick, so they had no way of getting things for their their children. To where um, myself and some other community partners worked together to to fulfill those needs for them by driving up. Um, and of course, you need an off-road vehicle in, in, on the Big Island, so you need some four-wheel drive at times. So sometimes you have to drive to places where uh, families needed some things and you just went up there to take care of it. And it, it went to show that the schools were helping because the principals at some point didn't even know uh, a challenge that a family was facing. And once presented to the, the principal, the principal will be like, okay, let's figure out a way to, to help. So with a community school aspect, now it's not, oh, okay, now I understand why this, this student or students are not doing well with their academics. They have all these outside things that need to be taken care of in order them to not worry and be able to concentrate on their, their school. And, you know, it, it takes, it takes time. It take it takes you know effort, and and I think somebody pointed it out. You need to be proactive, and and being proactive means um, getting out there, boots on the ground, and and doing doing things that you normally wouldn't do. I guess if you were um, thinking about traditional school. Next slide, please. So the idea of getting started and, and collaborating, and can move on to the the next one. It's all about building relationships. Um, relationships is such a key thing for what we're doing in Kohala because you have to build trust to gain the buy-in and to, to have the idea of knowing what everybody's strength is. 
I like to think of it as when we're building partnerships, we find out what the strength is of that partner. So when something comes up for a student or family that we can go to that partner and say, we know that you're very strong at this and that you can help us in, in this aspect. And with those partnerships and building trust and building relationships, we've been able to um, do things that we normally wouldn't have done um, otherwise being able to commute effectively and, and say, this is specifically what I'm, I'm looking for. Can you help me with finding, finding this? And as you move on to the next slide. So these are some of the community partnerships that, that we've built. And you see here, the list of, of partnerships here, we established them um, before COVID and, and the idea of Lilio Kalani Trust was, was a partner before COVID happened. And they, they helped us with some things as coming on campus and helping some students that needed um, help with, with certain things. Um, there was a time when COVID did happen and Lilio Kalani Trust, they had vehicles to be able to bring what we call Kiki Care Packs all the way from Hilo to Kohala so that we could give Kiki Care Packs to the children out here. So, each of our partners played a specific role and they had a specific strength that we we all work together. Uh, Vibrant Hawaii, some of you may have uh, heard about them, that they're trying to build resilience, uh, resilient communities on, on the Big Island. And in, in the next slide where I can um, explain a little bit more is the idea of the, the community partnerships with the family that you see on the top left side we have families there that were recipients of being helped from the schools and the and the community partners to where they wanted to pay it forward by helping and packing the food boxes during the pandemic. So they would come and they would help uh, pack the food boxes and the, the background in there, that's another community partner that had a, a, a refrigerator space where we could put all the food boxes inside so that we could hold it there for the next day's distribution. The picture on the top right is a church that opened up their space to where we could do the food distribution and not just a food distribution, but we'll get to the resilience hub soon. But the idea of they open up their area so that we could do the food distribution for the community. And, and so there was different partners that wanted to help in different ways. And it, it really helped everybody to work together to help not just the three schools, but the community as a whole. And as we move on to the, the next slide. So this resilience hub where the idea of listening really played a, a key part. One of the biggest needs during the pandemic was the idea of working parents having a place to drop off their children because they needed to work. Sometimes we think of uh, teachers as just teachers and that they don't have families of their own but we ran into a situation where at all three schools, teachers and staff had children that needed a place to go because they still needed to go to school and, and teach and reach out to the other students. So with Vibrant Hawaii and some other community partners for funding, they help us to put together what we call a resilience hub where the church in the previous picture opened up their building so that we could use it for the the working teachers and, and staff members from all three schools, but also other working parents to drop off their children at a safe place so that they could go to work to do their job. It was such a important piece that helped all three schools because in Kohala, we're in a rural area, finding substitute teachers is very hard to find. And if any of the teachers had to take off from school to take to take care of their children, the schools would be in a hard place. Um, one principal right now, she shared that she's actually covering some classes right now because she's shorthanded on on some teachers. So she's trying to find a, a teacher to, to be able to <laughs> teach those classes. So if any more teachers needed to take off, then it would put Kohala at a, at a in a hard place. But because of this resilience hub being open and Partners in Development Foundation um, and Vibrant Hawaii working together along with the churches 
and some other community partners, we were able to put this together. So we see on the top right, um, Big Island Face Shield, they were asking, can we come and teach the children about 3D printing? But we also wanna teach them about making um, the face shield so that they can make it. And then we can give it to other people who, who may need it um, to the, sorry, there we went. Today, for instance, I took some of those face shields to the Hamukua Health Center today nearby because they needed it for, for an event that is going to take place soon. So everyone is working together to help each other. The local restaurants made meals to help a church for a community meal. So everyone in the town is basically working together to, to help each other out. And with the idea of being a coordinator, I'm like the facilitator, the conduit, to where when people wanna know what the schools need, they'll come to me because they know that the principals have a lot already on their plate. And then I'll relay that information to the three principals to see um, what is needed. And then I relay the information back to them so that the principals can only, only need to talk to one person instead of talking to 50 people. So it, it's, it's a great way of being a, a coordinator to be able to be that facilitator between the schools and the, and the families and the community partners. Um, one of the things that I want to point out too is that the parent-teacher home visits is a key thing that happened as well. The elementary started doing home visits before COVID happened and it helped to build the relationships. And now during this COVID time, they're doing what we call uh, parent-teacher bridge visits where it's more like a Zoom visit but still checking in on the families to know how they're doing, what, the, what their needs are. And then the teachers will come to me and say, I found a need for a family. Can you help out with this? So being a, a coordinator um, really helps in the community school aspect. But I do want to point out that schools already have PCNCs. And I work with the PCNCs and we work together to create the, what do you call it? Invitations out to families or they, they help me with getting um, surveys out to the students so that we know what, what, what's needed. So it's, it's a lot of partnerships, it's a lot of teamwork, and it's a lot of work. But in the long run, when you take care of the outside needs, it does help with the academic piece. And you know, Vice Principal Suster, he showed that by helping all these children with haircuts, having them get glasses, going on home visits, that they've seen their attendance get better and better each year. So with the idea of community schools, it, it's, a, it's a great way of thinking it at a different way besides academics. So that's what I have for um, our presentation. Thank you so much, Ross. Um, for that awesome presentation. It's really awesome to see how your whole community is really coming together um, during this challenging time. So we're going to open it up for questions. So if anyone has a question, feel free to put it in the chat box um, or also feel free to just unmute yourself and um, we can take questions for both Vice um, Principal Suster and also Ross. Oh. I have a, a question for both of you. Aloha, everybody. This is Ka'anohi with Ohe. Um, mahalo so much for sharing all of the mo'olelo with, with Ha and, and just uplifting Hawaii. Mo'olelo is what matters most. And to see all of the work you folks are doing to go out into your communities and really understand the unique stories of your community and then taking action on that is super beautiful. Um, one of the questions that always comes up is funding for all of these initiatives, right? And even though community uh, is all answering the call, there's a need for funding to support it sometimes. And so maybe if you can share with us um, how you folks are fulfilling that need. And, and, and then on top of that, one of the biggest things we see with COVID is these actions, we wanna sustain them. We don't want them to just be a pandemic reactionary thing, um, but we're recognizing that this type of community needs to continue on beyond the pandemic. And so um, how do you see that funding becoming sustainable? Like how do you see yourself sustaining all of these actions. I can go for that. So with Partners in Development Foundation, they've been the, the 
the, the folks. I, I should say, I should thank my upper management because they're the ones that, you know, look out for the funding and, 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 the, and the grants and, and, and all these kinds of things. And grants is usually the, the biggest way that I seem to understand you have to write for the grant in order to run a community school. The, the conference that I went to two years ago, I believe in New York, I got to see a community school and, and other community school coordinators. And I, I asked the same question, how, how do you keep your community school running? And, and, and a lot of them said it's grants, it's, a, it's, a, it's about applying every three years and, and showing what we're doing to, to receive more funding. So if, if it's one of the challenges, I'd say the challenges is being able to find funding. And, and but when you do get that funding, like utilize it when you get it, like use it for the purpose of the community school and show action, show your evidence of how it's helping in your community because then you can use that evidence when you rewrite for the grant again. And, and so it, a lot of it is off of grants for a community school that I, that I understand. Yeah, I mean, similar with me, we've had um, like our White Paul Community Association, we've applied for that grant. Um, Walmart is another good one where they give um, community grants. So we've gotten a couple from Walmart. Uh, we did the Takai Transition Center. That's just a one-time grant though. So that we applied for a Takai Transition Center grant and we were able to get 14,000 off of that. So we use that a lot for our closet um, and toiletries and things like that. And then, you know, we kind of use money from MVA because we have a high homeless um, population as well as 21st century and be really creative with some of these monies and how we use them and some of the restrictions that they come with. But, you know, try and be as creative as possible in, in, in using these monies um, in collaboration rather than separately. So that's kind of how we've been doing it. And then you know, before pandemic, obviously, a lot of the fundraisers, fairs and things like that, which you can't really do right now, but hopefully we can slowly get back into some of those things, which will generate money to then go back to our community school. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Gail, you put a question in the chat. Would you like to say it? Um, for me, uh, the buy-in, that, that's difficult, right? Because, I mean, as much as I talk about how we're, you know, we're a community school, there's still not you know, that 100% buy-in. I think 100% is something that I don't know if any school will really get. But, um, you know, I was lucky enough to come in, to be in a situation where our counseling department was fully turning over, where people were retiring. And then I got three brand new counselors who were just motivated and, and I was able to mold them into a, how we needed them to be and what it needed to be. And they just kind of been gung-ho gung with it. And they've, they've, exceeded my expectations on, on what they're able to do and, and what they do on their own without me even saying it and, and being so willing to go out in a community, even at the height of the pandemic, they're in the community, um, you know, trying to reach out to families, trying to figure out, you know, why they're not on the computer, switching out computers, delivering packets to families in the community, delivering awards to families, because sometimes it's hard to only get the negative, right? Um, but by doing that, we have seen over the last three years, that more and more of our teachers are also reaching out to families in that type of capacity. Maybe not as in home visits, but they're making the calls. They're trying to get in contact with parents. They're trying to build those relationships more with the families. And we have definitely seen that grow exponentially over the last three years with, with a number of our teachers. But you're always gonna have the ones who say, that's not our job to do that. It's their responsibility. But you know, I keep trying to tell them that I'm you know, we're not doing this for the families per se, for the parents, we're doing this for the students, right? They, they didn't ask to be born into the situation that they're in, right? Um, you know, we're trying to do these things to help the student succeed so that it's not that cycle of poverty that will continue and continue. So um, just, you know, trying to get that message across is difficult. And I think we, if I had to put a number on it, I'd say we probably have a, about 70% buy in, in in what we're doing and, and where teachers are doing more than what they had done previously in, in regards to reaching out to families. Um, for, for us, for buy in, you know, when I talked about relationships, I really have to thank my parents because the relationship started with them because of my dad being a former educator at the, at the school. So that my last name is well known because of my 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 parents and, and what they did at the school. So 
you know, in Kuala, we like to say your name is either going to hurt you or it's going to help you in, in Kuala. So I, I got to say, I got to thank my parents because the name helped me. So when it, when it came to, to buy in, it was the idea of they knew the background of my family. And when I presented it to, to um, like the staff, they, they sort of were like hesitant at first, but they were willing to give it a, a, a shot and, and try. And, you know, first of all, your buy-in has to come in from, from your administration. So having three ad, administrators who were like, yes, we want to do it. That's your first, that, that to me was like your first goal, like getting their buy-in first, because then they'll let you, they'll let you have that conversations uh, with, with others at the school. And the other thing I wanted to point out is we got to make sure that we, we show that everybody is important when it comes to the buy-in. So going to the custodial staff, going to the cafeteria staff, I mean, I literally went and talked to, to them and said, hey, what's your concerns? What's your needs? What's going on? How, how can, if, it, if this is to be a community school, how can it help you? Because ultimately you folks are the ones that clean the, clean the bathrooms, clean the classrooms, take out the trash. You guys make the food for the children. You know, you folks are important to having a, a community school. So what is it that you folks need as well? I took those needs and then I talked to the three principals and then we figure out a way of how to work together. So it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of going out. It takes a lot of having that personal one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation. Sometimes, I mean, Zoom, it's okay when you need to do something like this, but face-to-face -face and having that, that contact and saying, you are important. If we're having a community school, what would that look like for you and how would you be helpful? Same thing for teachers. What, the, what would that look like for you? So for yourselves um, with this pandemic, being able to show the teachers and the staff how community school works by taking care of their children now. And now I can ask them, hey, I have other families of your students that need help. Would you be able to help? I get a, the percentage of them saying yes is much greater now because they actually understand oh, this is how community school works. We take care of the needs of not just um, the families who come to school, but you folks have families and we wanna take care of your families as well. So buy-in, it takes a lot of work. It, it, it's, it's having those deep conversations. And, and I think people need to see what that looks like and have an example like Waipahu Elementary School and showing that example of what's going on there. It, it, it really goes to, oh, okay, so that's how that works. So buy in it takes time it, it, it's you never gonna you're gonna continue to have those conversations to get more and more buy-in from different people thank you Ross, um, and thank you james duster um i know that we can talk about community schools for a long long time it's something that i'm very very passionate about it i think i think community school is a strategy that a lot of our schools can implement to support not as Ross just said, not just our kids or the, the school kids, but the whole community as well. But saying that it's almost 11 and I know some people are going to uh, start um, getting off the, the call, but we, we have one more question that I would like to answer after uh, you complete the survey. We have a very short evaluation form that we would like you to complete. Um, and also, please let us know if you would like to have a second, like a part two of a community school conversation, because we are willing to host another another meeting to talk about this. The other uh, thing that we would like to share with you is, as we were speaking, the federal administration announced the new release of request for proposal for this full services community school grant. I know it's a very competitive grant, uh, but I think it's worth applying for it. Um, because we believe that the Biden administration is going to increase the funding for that grant, no, not for this round, but for the next round. So I hope you apply for it and learn in the process, if, even if you don't get it. And then ne the next uh, term, we maybe we have more funding to get the grant here in Hawaii. Uh, there is uh, one more question uh, about challenges for community schools. And I know there are a lot of challenges that you face trying to implement this strategy. So the Vice Principal Soster and, and Ross, would you like to share very briefly some of the challenges and maybe solutions for those challenges? Uh, for, for me, the, 
two big challenges that I saw um, that I face um, when we do this type of work. Um, one is the liability um, for some of the things we do, right? So if we're transporting people or kids or even our adults that are using our car. So one of the challenges is that like my counselor got into two car accidents over the last two years with our state car. So um, that can be a challenge and how, you know, if, you know, it was just small accidents. So nobody really got hurt, but things like that and, and, and spreading your, your, your wings into the community. Some of those things are, things that come up I always get questions about liability and, and bringing students to school and, and you know when when things pre-COVID um, when we would do home visits the other thing that's it's really difficult and, and I've talked to you know Paul and Jen about this too is you know we'll go to the same student's house 20 times you know in, in a two-month period and, and nothing changes right so and, and we, we try and talk to the parents and try to support and, and and give them whatever help they need, but there's still no reciprocation from them. So that's the, the, the really challenging part for us is that we don't want to say, oh, you know what, we're just not going to go on this home visit anymore, even though we're tempted to because we, we get nothing back from them, right? There's no, there, there's no help on their end. So um, that for me is the biggest challenge when you have this student where you see so much potential, but then the parents are just not following through with what we need them to do, right? Even though we're, 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 we're giving them the supports that we feel like they need and, and to, to be successful, they still can't wake up at eight o'clock to get them on the computer and, and, and make sure that they're staying on or, you know, that type of stuff. So th those are the two big challenges that we faced um, over the last few years. Um. For, for us, you know, somebody mentioned it, you know, funding. Probably funding is probably one of the biggest challenges when it comes about to be able to keep running the community school. And um, for, I guess, one of the biggest challenges for, for us is because it's with three schools and, and being able to collaborate, you know, having to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, but like I said, I'm appreciative of the three principals because they're already working together. But like I said, usually it's one coordinator per school. So it, it, my challenge is trying to get myself to three different to the schools and, and, and moving around um, and, and, and being able to sit in on, on meetings. But that's where, that's where I asked the PCNCs to help me out by giving me updates on, on whatever meetings that come up. So, you know, there's gonna be challenges all the way around. We have to learn and, and adjust every, every day, every week. Um, some, you all know when pandemic happened, it seemed like changes happened every hour to, you had to adjust to the, to the next hour. So we just learning how to adjust and, and adapt to, to the different things that changed throughout each day. Okay. Jen, would you like to say anything? Any other questions? I know there are a lot of questions. <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to uh, say a huge mahalo to um, Vice Principal Suster and Ross for just sharing your story and, and being open um, with the challenges that you're, you're facing. But we, this is great work that we need to do, that our, we need to, you know, be able to support our children and families during this time. And so thank you for sharing and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, and we hope we, yes, we will continue this conversation. So <laughs> thank you all. And we we'll hope to see you um, soon. Hi, thank you.